one of the bravest men in the country uh, today by many people's reckoning. Uh, John Wedger, thank you for joining us. Please uh, speak freely to the Commission. I'm recently retired from the Metropolitan Police where I served as a detective. I specialised in child abuse investigations and I, what is relevant to, uh, to me being here today was, was my service whilst on the uh, specialist vice unit. I had been asked to look into an allegation made by a 14-year-old girl that she is being used as a prostitute. On looking into it, it appeared that this girl was one of many. She gave me another girl, who in turn gave me another, in turn gave me another, and it just spiralled. Uh, very, very quickly, um, we had dozens of young kids aging from 9 to 14 years old. All of them were subject to care orders. Uh, either looked after or, you know, um, in placements, homes or whatever, but all known to the, uh, the social services. Um, a lot of them were known to the police um, for being missing persons and everything else. And all of them were addicted to crack cocaine and heroin mm. and were all being pimped out, as the term goes, by one person, which was a, a female prostitute who was very well known to the Met Police. And this woman had connections with, alleged connections with um, high-ranked officers and also um, a local magistrate and um, someone that was high up here, executive status in the BBC. Uh, this woman seemed to work with impunity for many, many years. And when looking into it, this actual uh, racket had been going on for a long, long time. What I did was I exposed my findings I committed them to paper in what was just a basic intelligence report and I took it to a senior officer and what I must say that this isn't the first time that I'd been shut down for exposing um, child abuse offences. Uh, a couple of years prior to that, if I may jump the timeline, was I was on an inquiry looking into transient paedophiles that had failed to register and I found out that they were residing on canal boats within the inland waterway network of the UK. They had information from within the prison service that there were two um, paedophiles that were living on boats. Now boats um, had a lot of poignancy in as much as uh, there was freedom to travel. The canal network was very, very old and therefore didn't get policed. And children liked boats. And the BBC had a, a program at the time um, which sort of... Um, uh, it, it, it was to do with two little dolls that lived on a canal boat called Rosie and Jim and it was tied in at the same time as I was looking into this so kids were drawn to the waterways the, the, I'll get back to the main story but the, the reason for telling this bit was that I was told that there were, were two sex offenders I was asked to look into it as a field intelligence officer and if I found another two within a set period of time they'd be happy within that period of time I'd found 90 um, I came into work and I was told by a high-ranked officer that the inquiry had been shut down and the reason given was that they couldn't afford the funding for me. <laughs> but I had been approached by a Scotland Yard detective who told me, he said, um, when you investigate any crime and you do well at it, you get praised. When you look into child abuse cases, the opposite happens. Be very careful. He then told me about a cabinet minister that they'd investigated on a few occasions and on each occasion they've been shut down uh, so I was aware that this had gone on uh, when I questioned uh, the senior officer about you know the real reason he told me John I'm so sorry it's come from high up there's nothing I can do and promised me any job I wanted so I moved on to the the vice unit um, so I was expecting to be praised for what I found out uh, each day a new child would be found and it, it was just spiraling I was brought before um, someone who is now a very, very high-ranked officer in the UK indeed. And he sat me down and he said, John, um, I've got to be very uh, upfront with you. And I said, well, I'd like to be upfront with you, Governor, as well. And he said, you know, you're out of all the officers I've got here. There was about, I don't know, 40 officers. He said, you're, you're the second best one I've got, which was a good accolade. He said, but unfortunately, you've dug too deep. What the hell have you done? Now, on a personal level, um, since the uh, beginning of 2000, I'd brought up four children on my own, and this was common knowledge within my unit. And he said to me, if you ever disclose what you found out, you will lose your home, 
your children and your job. You must shut the F up. And he said, you will be thrown to the walls. You have no idea who and what you are dealing with. He said, I'm warning you now, you must back away. And then he said something quite strange. And he said that if you say a word of this, um, and even if you make a complaint, it will come back to me and it will go in the bin. I and no one else will ever betray fellow rank. Shut your mouth. So I walked away from that, from that investigation and I moved on. I was offered to stay, but I couldn't. What was very strange was that the, the main um, witness, the young girl that came forward, was found dead in the street very shortly afterwards on a suspicious drug overdose, which sort of compounded matters. Um, I then moved on to um, work on child abuse investigations, which is slightly different to vice. And I, I can, if I have the time, explain why there is this compartmentalization within these institutions. And it's all down to remits and uh, justifiable reasons for actually doing nothing as opposed to doing something. Um, I went on to a child abuse unit in, in one of the poorer boroughs of London and I was asked if I would like, as well as an investigator, to take on a second role dealing with various sort of issues they have. And I was told you'll get a day here and there to go to a meeting. And I asked to look into uh, if there were anyone was dealing with children's homes. I was told no, there was an officer that was dealing with children's homes, uh, but she'd left two years ago and she didn't do anything anyway because nothing happens, there's no problem. And I asked this sergeant, are there any problems with child prostitution within the kids' homes? He said, what are you on about? No, of course not. I got a list, and this is almost real time as I'm telling it now, I got a list faxed through to me from social services with all the children's homes. There was 26 kids' homes. I picked up the phone, and I spoke to the fella, and I asked him how many kids they have. And on, on an average, there's about five children reside in these children's homes. And I said, no, I'm not pointing the finger. No one's in any trouble. How many of these children do you lose at the weekend? Which is the usual pattern of, of missing, you know, when kids go missing. And so out, out of the five, we lose three. And I said, no, honestly, what happens to them? They went, oh, they're being pimped out. So I'd found this officer that had dealt with it for years had found none. Within this, honestly, this was the time as we're speaking now. Within this period of minutes, I found three. By the end of that day, I'd found six. By the end of three days to five days, I'd found 50. I held a meeting with all the concerned agencies, which involved charities, which involved NGOs, which involved social services, and I highlighted the problem. And I was then harangued, really. I was attacked verbally by head of children's services for this borough, saying to me, what the effing hell have you done? I said, well, you knew about these kids. I said, yeah, but they hadn't come out, so we're not worried. The children were making money, so therefore the children weren't worried. The children had a boyfriend, which was their pimp. Therefore, they, they thought this was love. Um, and the children were also using drugs, so therefore they want to continue to use drugs. So they weren't coming to notice. So therefore, social services had written them off, despite the fact that the children's homes would constantly um, be getting in the logs that they were being picked up and they were going missing. These were regular missing persons. The police have a missing persons unit. They say so many thousands of kids go missing every year. They do, but a lot of them do return. But what is never looked into is what happens when they're going missing. They are working as prostitutes. Um, and again, the, the child abuse units won't look into them because they say it's not interfamilial because it's someone else pimping them out. The bigger cities have vice units Vice units will not deal with them because they say that these are kids subject to care orders. So no one looks into it and it goes on and it festers and it festers. And then funny enough, after this meeting, I was shut down and moved again. Um, I then came forward a couple of years later. I, I was actually genuinely concerned that I would lose my children. I, I know how powerful the police are and I know what they're, they're capable of um, having worked with them. I blew the whistle a few years ago and I was told that my allegations would be taken um, at the, the highest level. I asked to speak to a high-ranked female detective and this was questioned. And then they did get me a high-ranked female detective and she said to me, why are you talking to me? 
And no one else has said, because you cannot roll up your trouser leg. Uh, and she said, I understand exactly what you mean. They instigated allegations of corruption against high-ranked officers. Um, when you uh, investigate these um, crimes, as a, as a witness and informant as I was, you're meant to get regular updates every 28 days. I never received one in three years. The matter was passed from one unit to another unit. It ended up with the IPCC, who again did nothing and failed to update me, despite the fact that they had corroborating evidence. I met with other police whistleblowers uh, via a few concerned MPs. One of them was a lady called Maggie Oliver, who had exposed the scandal in Rochdale. Another one was a man called Lenny Harper, who had exposed the horrendous goings on at a kid's home called Hope de la Garenne in Jersey. Each one of them uh, echoed each other. They both said, they're going to come for you and they will come hard. And I said, what do I expect? They said, right, you will be served with gross misconduct papers. You will be interviewed. They will find against you. You will be sacked and you will probably face a court case and, and may go to jail. Now, the threats that was echoed to me, you'll lose your home, your job, your children. At the same time, the police stopped paying me. I went without wages for nearly three years. I had three children at home. Four children, sorry. Um, then what happened was that they served me gross misconduct papers. And I was told what it will be for will be for data protection violations, which seems to be a common occurrence. <coughs> I got served with numerous data protection violations. Each one could have given me a two-year prison sentence. Um, and this continued and continued. Now, what also happened um, during this period was that one of my children was um, involved in a life-changing and catastrophic accident in which... He was initially declared dead. Uh, they revived him. He was on life support for many, many months. Um, I got a call from the hospital uh, to attend the hospital where they had actually lost him. He had been dead for 10 minutes. So I was called down to the hospital to um, basically identify him. I turned up and they had actually revived him within this period, but they deemed him as brain dead, although he was on full 100% um, uh, life support. Uh, a colleague of mine was so concerned as I had no money. And for three days I slept in my car and stayed by my son's side. My son actually uh, made signs of, of life and I was able to return home. But my colleague had, had brought this to the attention of senior officers just saying, you know, you've got to help this man. He's done actually done nothing wrong. The Met Police's response to this, when I got home, they'd sent two child protection officers round to interview my youngest boy on allegations that I left him home alone while I was with my dying son. So the um, threats of you will lose your home, your job and your children rang true. I persisted. I refused to give up and I set up a forum, a working group with all the police whistleblowers and it extended and it, and it branched out. The uh, IPCC stopped investigating the crime. Um, I was meant to be given a full breakdown of what went on and I was given a one paragraph letter and told not to contact them again. We're not investigating it. Their uh, answer was that the three high ranked officers that I'd accused of corruption, they went and spoke to them and they denied it. And that was the extent of their investigation. And all them years as an investigator, I've been doing it wrong. We've just got to ask someone if they've done it. And if they say no, that's it. And that was, that was what they expected me to swallow and tell me not to contact them again. I took the matter to the policing minister at the time, uh, a member of the Privy Council and a member of the government's cabinet, he met with me and he was actually, to my surprise, appalled. He arranged for a meeting with the Home Office. The Home Office then got their independent investigation team in, involved and stated that there will be an independent investigation into my claims. And they deemed that the Met Police and the IPCC had failed and they will look into it. I was summoned to a meeting uh, and it was a fully recorded meeting in, and it was witnessed and in which the cabinet minister handed my paperwork over to the home office officials and um, that was an official handover of the paperwork which I supplied to him. They then gave me their assurances that they will um, 
be in touch with me and give me a 24 hour contact number and said they will um, investigate this independently. I never heard from them again. They have since denied um, receiving any paperwork when pushed. They admitted they did receive it, but have now lost it. We are seeing police failings in respect to child prostitution hemorrhaging in this country, but we are seeing them on a provincial level. We're seeing them in Rochdale, Blackpool, Rotherham. We're seeing them in Oxford, Aylesbury, Swindon, all on a provincial level. London is one of the largest urban conurbations in the Western world. It has got one of the biggest police forces. We haven't heard one thing about organised child prostitution in London. And the reason being is that those high up have been covering it up. And this goes right to the heart. I was um, met with, as I said, Lenny Harper. Children were killed at Hope de la Garenne, in which Lenny Harper had forensic evidence, which was then went missing. And he said to me, you be careful, what you're looking at will go right to the heart of the establishment. I sat down with the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Cressida Dick, and I explained to her what was going on. And I explained the dynamics of how you groom a child. I said, I can take a child out of the care system. I can groom that child. I can have sex with that child. I can get my friends to have sex with that child. I can pimp that child out. You have not appointed one officer to investigate that. Yet if I leant over my fence and called my neighbour a derogatory term, I'd lose my home, my job, I'd be signing on a register, and I'd never work for the Met Police again. How is that justifiable? How is it justifiable? Um, I now work with victims and survivors of abuse. I help out with... Um, recovering alcoholics and drug addicts. I'm working in collusion now with one of the um, most notorious gangsters uh, the UK had and the convicted murderer, Chris Lambriano. And I've never had such support and compassion mm. from these people, yet the police would have had me swinging from a rope if they've had their own way. When we look at our prison ser service, we look at our prison system, 75% of uh, inmates are illiterate. This is in the UK, they're illiterate. 75% of our inmates have come from abused backgrounds. We have a recidivism rate of 75%. The system does not work. Child abuse is at the root of all of this. Child abuse units, when I was on them, I've worked on many specialist units in the police. I've worked on units that have been anti-government. I've worked on units that have been financial crime. You get given a car. You get given an expense account, you get given unlimited overtime. When I was on child abuse, we had a car between 10 of us. I worked with three alcoholics because the work was so horrendous and impactive. We had no respite. We were worked till we were dropping. And we were, we would have appointments to see psychiatrists every six months, but they weren't to sign us off. They were to keep us going. Say, oh, you're all right, you're all right. Keep going, keep going. They deliberately underfund anything to do with child abuse, deliberately, and it's, it's done for a reason. I had many informants that came from the street. They were beggars. They were drug addicts. They had all been sexually abused as children. One of them told me of a scenario when he was in a kid's home at the age of four, was raped on his first night by a Catholic priest. He then went on to be raped daily and whipped and beaten. He became a drug addict and he ended up as a rent boy on the street at an area of the, of the West End where I used to work as a vice copper. And that was what was classed as the meat rack in Piccadilly Circus where young boys were, were openly picked up for the purpose of prostitution. It was known about. He went to get in a car and he was in trouble. He needed drugs, so he needed the money. And he had a pimp, and he said, a pimp wasn't a bad thing. A pimp actually looked after me. I was safer with a pimp on the street than I was in a kid's home. He went to get into a car, which was a white Rolls Royce with two men in it. And his pimp said, don't go in that car. The last two boys went in there. They killed him. We never saw them again. He gesticulated for the driver to drive around the block. And his pimp didn't see this. His pimp thought he'd walked away. But he didn't. He got in the car. He was then taken to a, a very affluent part of London called Hampstead. 
he was then subjected to three days of torture and sexual violence in which he said that they knew that they'd killed him. And he said they dumped his lifeless body on Hampstead Heath by the Royal Free Hospital, believing he was dead. And he said, what, what shocked me more, John, was the fact that these two men, they were well dressed, they had a big house and they were actually getting ready to go to their niece's wedding whilst they were dropping my lifeless body off, the perceived lifeless body off on a bit of Heath ground. Yet it goes on consistently, mm. consistently. Back in 2003, the justice system brought in what they called the Bad Character Act. Before, you could never bring in someone's previous convictions within a, a legal trial in the UK, unless it was a very, very serious one. And then it was very difficult. There were too many legal parameters. They brought this in and everyone thought that it was, it was a coup. It was a step forward in gaining justice. But when you commit acts, minor acts of shoplifting, it's dishonest crime. You are then deemed a dishonest person. Every person I dealt with, every street person, every crack-taking prostitute had been abused as a child. They all committed dishonest crime to stay alive. Right? They shoplifted. They, they pimped themselves. Whatever they did, they did it to survive, to buy their drugs, to carry on. So whenever they were brought in a trial as a witness, they were instantly deemed as dishonest. And this is what we're seeing now when, when people are coming forward, that they are rubbish and they're broken. And one, one of the startling things that occurred was uh, back in the beginning of 2000, they brought over Mayor Giuliano from New York to preach to us on a thing called the broken window theory. And what his theory was, that if there was an area that were of depravity that had a broken window or a damaged bus shelter, to clean it up, smarten it up, you won't get your drug dealers, you won't get your shoplifters, you won't get, you know, your, your robberies, that all these crimes that are in the periphery around sort of poverty and everything else. And therefore, your society gets better. Smarten these broken windows up. It was naive at the least. Where is this timeline taken back? The fact is they're doing drugs because they're paying for heroin. They're on heroin because heroin is an analgesic. It's a painkiller. Pain can be mental, emotional, as well as physical. And the majority of them were there doing the drugs because they come from the care system. The care system that had appallingly let them down and that they had been sexually abused and they had no way of processing the damage that had been done to them. Our judicial system sets them up to fail. It follows them through from cradle to grave. These kids are known about, yet nothing happens. They grow up, they become bad in class, they become violent. They get, they get reported to the social services, yet the problem is still not addressed. They then commit minor acts and end up before the juvenile courts. Again, nothing is done. They commit then heavier acts, robberies, whatever, and end up before the magistrate's courts, yet nothing is done. They end up before the Crown Courts and ultimately they end up going before the Coroner's Courts. Yet throughout all this circle, nothing ever breaks it. The people that are paid a good living wage to stop this are failing it. Failing it. And sometimes it's deliberate. Sometimes it's apathy. Sometimes it's ignorance. I've just come back from Rotherham, a town in the a small steel town um, in the northwest cluster of the UK. I met with a social worker who had exposed the child prostitution problem. Um, she ran an outreach group and the kids were coming to her and then one would tell her another and she looked into it. It was organised prostitution. It's a small little town. 2,000 children were being pimped out. She got attacked. She got attacked from the police. Her husband nearly lost his job. It nearly brought her to this point of suicide. And this is what they do. It's orchestrated and it was manipulated at the highest echelons. And she said it was coming from the high ranking officers. And it was. But yet all they would offer up would be the lower ranking officers for some form of malfeasance, whatever. But it is being orchestrated at the very top. <coughs> My investigation showed a strong link with high ranked officers and organised criminals. I spoke with another um, child abuse investigator in um, a quite a high ranked officer, and I spoke to him from Manchester. Again, he proved, had a proven link between high ranked officers and organized criminals and child prostitution there. We had a, um, a glimmer of hope 
in the form of a chief constable, a commissioner of police for a county called Wiltshire. The man's name is Mike Veal. He stood up and he investigated child prostitution, child trafficking, child abuse, everything else, but involved former Prime Minister Ted Heath. He turned around in Parliament and he said, if they can attack me because he come under attack, and he said he came under attack from places he didn't even know existed. And he said, if they can attack me, God knows what they'll do to John Wedger, which in a way was a bit of an accolade. But, and I spoke to him and he said, it, it, it's just vile, John. Yeah. It is vile. I then looked at how many police officers, the policeman's biggest fear is going to prison. And they know it. They know it. This is deliberate. What we're looking at is deliberate. I was a good guy. When you're a policeman, you take an oath, and your oath is, I will act without fear or without favour. Someone said to me, John, do not brace your, your own bravery on others. Don't judge others for, for the lack of bravery and commitment shown. I do not see myself as brave. I see myself as a man who, who believes in protecting the vulnerable, doing God's work, and doing what my, my, my oath said to act without fear or without favour. They are going against their oath. And I said, we will look at this word fear, shall we? What are they frightened of? Telling the truth. Where the real fear lies is this young child laying in the kid's home at night and they're coming and they're taking the blankets from over him. That's the real fear. You know, we need to get a grip. You come under attack and you do come under attack and it's painful when it hurts. And it does, and it does do its best to destroy you. Maggie Oliver said to me, John, I was going to prison. The CPS turned around and said, we've got enough evidence. If you don't come to some agreement, admit to whatever, then you're found guilty, you will go to prison. She had to tell her children she was going to prison. The CPS in the end with me turned around and said, John Wedge's mitigation was so powerful, we could never convict him. I said to them, I submitted my statement prior to any trial. I wrote a statement and I gave it to Chris and Dick. I said, here's my statement. Whatever you say I've done, I've done. I don't care. But I will not be tried by you. I will be tried in a Crown Court. And I will be tried by my peers and I will be tried fairly. I've done nothing wrong. And I listed every single person from the bottom right the way up to the top. Who was involved? Who knew about it? Who did nothing? Who then did nothing? Who did nothing? This went right up to Bernard Hogan Howe. And now to uh, Chris Dick. Bernard Hogan Howe knew about this. Knew about this. The um, campaign of bullying on me was orchestrated under his command. He has now been appointed by the House of Lords to look into child grooming gangs and how they existed. Well, I might save him the trouble. I can do that for him. You know, it is wrong. It is wrong there. Looking now, I was asked to... Um, make an address to uh, Lord Pearson's office regarding the uh, presence of grooming gangs and, and, and how it works, how it's the mechanics of it all. They're looking at it from a very sort of um, religious background that it's Muslim gangs. This is a bigger picture. This is a bigger picture. Kids are a commodity. And one of the, the things which I will I want to refer back to is um, yourself, Commissioner, to my right, mentioned about the Mark de True. Whenever I give a talk, you have to make things relevant. We don't look at the third world and how they're dealing with things because there are different people. They, were, they, they looked, if they drove on a different side of the road, they were a different colour. Let's look at what we got on our backyard. One of the countries that's demographically very similar to us is Belgium. In living memory, it went on in Belgium, you know, and it went on with Mark de True. And the kids that came forward were well, was so pigeonholed in what they could talk about. Anything that, that went outside of Mark de True, they weren't allowed. I think it was 23 to 25 civilian witnesses died in the lead up to the trial. 90. Unbelievable. Total 90. Un absolutely unbelievable, yep. And then the people took the power back. They blew the windows out with the fire engines of the parliamentary office. And then they... Um, sprayed horse manure all over the building and they took to the streets, didn't they? Half a million people. people. Half a million people. Mm -hmm. And what do we do? We only kick off when someone throws a cat in a wheelie bin. <laughs> if we allow our children yeah. to be attacked and preyed on in this way, we have failed as a decent and moral society. And we are doing that. And we are doing nothing. It has to stop. And they have to back 
I don't want no glory, but people like myself, we need backing and we need it. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, the Commonwealth Parliament in Australia passed an act called the Public Interest Disclosure Act to protect whistleblowers. The act says quite clearly that if you blow the whistle on corruption or whatever you blow it on, you cannot be charged with a, 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 another offence in retaliation for what you've done. Two Supreme Court judges in Australia have said the act does not apply. Well, it's the same with the police. They are not subject to any, any employment law. They just do what they want. Yes. And, and when we look at suicides, the, the uh, um, Office of National Statistics will not keep any information on police suicides. We went to Boston, and police suicides are twice that of any high-risk occupation. These coppers are so worried they're going to prison, they commit suicide, and it happens. Yeah. Um, I just make the point as well that uh, us barristers are under the same oath of fear of favour, and yeah. um, yes. we're very glad to take your testimony, and, no, no, and we will you. act. Oh, God bless you. you. God bless thank you, you too. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hutzabat, who's a criminologist and psychotherapist, has a question for you. Yeah, a question, not really a question, more of a statement and a question. Uh, if the one million dollar uh, Robert was speaking about would have been used and have, will be used for people like you, supporting you when you lose your jobs and you have no income for your children. Would that make a big, a big difference for other officers to talk and do what they have to do, their jobs? That's yeah, my question. it's financial bullying and they know it mm. and they do and this, that's why they do it. And one of the strange things which happened to myself and another whistleblower was my bank account was shut down yeah. for no reason. That's the second, and I know someone else, you know. but it would, you, you need to live. And, they, and it was really, it was the fact that good people funded me, you know, and got me through yeah. it. But. Would it help you and other whistleblowers and people that want to do their job if this commission uh, succeeds in gathering money to financially help your families? Would that help people coming forward for doing, to do their jobs, to be able, to, because we have to change the system from within. But if you, people like you, police officers, under oath, wa wanting to help people or not even in the possibility to do your jobs, well, then it's finished, isn't it? And it is finished, if we are honest, it is finished. Yep. The system failed over the whole line. Also, health care, everything that has to do with children mm -hmm. failed, and that's planned. But the, the question is, do you think that more people like you would continue doing their jobs even with all the, the, the pressure they have, if they know that if something happens, there will be a backup for their families, uh, protecting their families and money to survive. Do yeah. you think that more people would come forward and continue their jobs? I'd like to say yes. The, the one thing is, it's um, the, the police pension, you know, you look at losing your pension, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what does it, that's that what keeps them in silence. But you do need money, and also recourse to, to, to some sort of legal assistance. You know, I had to, the police federation, each legal firm they gave me refused to take my case on. Yeah. I went independent, they took me on yeah. straight away. Fact, straight yours, away. Yeah. Yeah. You're prisoned. Uh, John, as a former spy, we're obscenely proud of having the highest rates of alcoholism, adultery, uh, divorce and suicide yeah, yeah. Uh, so I do understand to a certain extent I am so deeply moved by your testimony yeah. and your integrity um, why haven't you been killed I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. Jesus loves me yeah hopefully you know I've got a few more years now. I've got I've got a job to do you know I've got a job to do your grace there's a great uh, power John thank you very much indeed for thanks so many did it reach the media in, in the UK? This is one question. Yeah. Second, have you been approached, asked, questioned by, by uh, one of the church leaders in... Uh, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that. The, the media, one of, one of my saving graces, and it, and it didn't meant to happen. I, um, something Sasha mentioned the other day to me was about doing a testimony and keeping it for legal purposes. I actually did an interview with the UK column with a man called Brian Gerrish, 
and he said it was too hot to handle and put it out online. And and I thought, oh my God, what's he done? But it actually saved me. It saved me. The, so the alternative media really did help me. When I left, the national media have been okay. There's been a couple of good journalists. One of the journalists has tried to move it forward, but gone now to a different paper and they won't touch me. But the other thing is, um, I'm a Catholic and I wrote to Vincent Nichols and he said, nothing I can do. So other Catholics got together and wrote to him and said, why? If you can't do anything, then why are you there? And he said, I'll see what I can do. And he said he couldn't get involved. And I said, but you got involved with the McCann case. Why can't you get involved here? And this is what you find with all these departments that claim to have ownership for supporting people. They are useless. They do nothing. And I was appalled by Vincent Nichols. I, I thought the man showed no integrity. Nothing. However, the, on the local level, Priest has been very, very good. And also, um, there's been a few Christian groups that have been phenomenally good. And there's also been a group of Orthodox Jews in New York mm. have raised quite a lot of money for me as well. So mm. it's come from everywhere and really supportive, but on a lower level, though. Thank you, John. Uh, any, uh, uh, Commissioner Helstein, a very brief que a question. We're running so late. Thank you. <coughs> really brief and I will uh, explain why I'm asking yeah. so briefly. Uh, as you practically were in that flame, in that horror yeah. and in that danger, yeah. and you really are touching very nearly, so maybe your intuition, your mind, your all human said, what is the force from the society, from the court, from everywhere? which could help you to solve the cases like this, like many uh, these cases. What, I, what were, you, were you dreaming of? A force. Okay, because you felt uh, helpless. I'm, I'm sorry for that word. No, no, that's, that's good. I, I wanted the platform. I've been threatened and bullied into silence. It was a conspiracy of silence. I, I was screaming inside. The world needed to know. And one of the biggest gifts we, we have been given in the UK, which this man didn't deem it as a gift. He actually, you know, was the Jimmy Savile thing. You know, he inadvertently did God's work to such a degree. And, and it opened up, really, the middle classes in this country to the fact this was going on. And someone said to me, do you find that your world gets so, so small when you deal with this? And I said, explain. He went, well, no one wants to talk about it. Can we not talk about it, please? Can we not hear it? Can we not? And it's, it's getting it out there. And then when you realize that you're not mad, it's not a conspiracy. And when you do get those that have been affected by it, I gave a talk to 50 recovering alcoholics and drug addicts, some of which were people of extreme violence. There was a fear that I would be attacked in the room for giving this talk. Some of these people had served time for murder and torture. They got up, they applauded me, and they hugged me. And it was one of the most life-defining moments I've ever met. And that was, that was my real audience, saying, I'm doing it because okay. you need it. Thank you for that. Um, I'm so sorry. I have to call no, no. time now. Uh, John Wedger, this commission salutes you. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming no. today. Thank you. Thank you. are the power behind the ITNJ. Add your voice. Sign the treaty.